With a new career and a new husband, 48-year-old Sharon Daniels' fresh start in life was, by all accounts, an unqualified success. She worked so hard to get her education and went back to school. This was a smart, successful school teacher. But on the morning of September 18, 2005, everything she'd worked so hard for would come to a sudden, violent end. 911, what is your emergency? Yes, ma'am. I've just shot my husband three times. Born in 1957, Sharon Rossum was raised in the East Texas town of Kilgore. I enjoyed a good childhood, a Christian background, raised by a mom and a dad, a very loving family. After high school, she skipped college, married at 20, and worked a series of clerical jobs. I pursued secretarial work for a major company, got married, and had children. And it's just happy. But after almost 25 years of marriage, Sharon and her husband split up. Children got grown. They grew apart, so they divorced. For Sharon, the divorce was her chance to pursue a lifelong dream. In 2001, at the age of 44, she went back to school and became a teacher. My dad was a teacher, a principal, a coach. Uh, most of the people I knew were educators. Family tradition, however, wasn't her sole motivation. There was also financial independence. She didn't want to depend on anybody. She didn't want to depend on her parents, on her brothers. Uh, she didn't want to depend on any man. But just because Sharon didn't want to depend on a man didn't mean she wasn't interested in men. At the end of 2001, one man in particular caught her eye. He was her church's charismatic new associate pastor, David Daniels. He carried himself well, put it that way. The way he dressed, the way he acted. David, also recently divorced, was just as impressed with Sharon. Early in 2002, the couple had their first date. It was Dutch Treat. He would say that um, because of his prior relationship, his prior marriage, that his finances were not what they used to be. Over dinner, David explained he'd been cleaned out by his recent divorce and was working three different jobs in an attempt to get back in the black. He was guard at the prison in Henderson. He was a bus driver in Kilgore, and then he preached on the weekends. Sharon, still enjoying her newfound freedom, didn't mind picking up her share of the tab. Being sort of independent, um, you don't just date somebody for money. The couple's marriage in April of 2002 wasn't for money either. Right off the bat, they all agreed that their money would be kept separate. I had a prenuptial agreement drawn up, and he signed it. But not long after Sharon said, I do, she realized David's recent divorce wasn't the only source of his money troubles. Mr. Daniels was not a good money manager. He thought... You spent money, you spent money, you spent money. You charged, you charged, you charged. David, despite the prenuptial agreement, expected her to pay his bills. He couldn't understand why her money wasn't his. And that led to a lot of stuff. As time went on, the arguments grew more and more heated. Then in September of 2004, things definitely took a turn for the worse. He spat on me. In my face, three times, just <laughs> and I said, you're not going to do that and stay in this house. Sharon ran to the bedroom, locked herself in, and called the cops. And the deputy ended up returning uh, without making an arrest. The next time Sharon Daniels dialed 911, however, there would be an arrest. In September of 2005, David Daniels made a down payment on a brand new truck. The check promptly bounced. The check came back hot that he'd paid down on the truck. When the dealership called looking for their money, David asked Sharon to help. She just said, I refuse. He had to go to, get, go to his mother to get a truck. 
David's mother ended up giving him the money. He kept the truck, and that Friday, drove Sharon out for their regular date night, a high school football game. High school football around here is. It's more than just the game itself. It is Friday night church. The whole community's there. Sharon and David were season ticket holders and even had matching stadium seats. But that night, as they walked to the stands, David left her seat in the back of his new pickup. He wouldn't tote her since she mentioned him. You always tote my seat. You can tote your own. And things like that all during that game. And I think they even finally left and went home early because they were kind of sharp with each other. The next morning, David said he wasn't feeling well. He spent most of the day in bed and even skipped his night shift job at a local prison. She tries to get him up at 10 o'clock to go to work. He ignored her. He didn't pay any attention to her. He rolled over and was going to go to sleep. Exasperated, Sharon lay down beside her husband. But her long simmering feud with David was anything but over. When they woke up at 5.30 that next morning is when things got a little out of hand. Are either one of you hurt at all? I shot him three times. At around 6 a.m. on September 18, 2005, sheriff's deputies responded to a 911 call from the Kilgore, Texas home of Sharon and David Daniels. Sharon, the caller, was calmly waiting outside when the deputies pulled into the driveway. She was on the front porch in the rocker. They came and put her in the car, handcuffed her, you know, for their safety and everybody else's, not knowing exactly what happened. Deputies found their first clues just inside the door on the kitchen counter. There was a 38 snub nose Rossi, I believe it was, revolver that was sitting there and had three empty casings just in a neat little row right beside it. The scene in the master bedroom wasn't so neat. There was obvious large amount of blood in the middle of the bed, just saturated, and there was a large amount of blood off to the right-hand side of the bed in a trail straight into the bathroom. The bathroom door was locked. The deputy broke it down. The first deputy on scene finds Mr. Daniels, uh, David Daniels, in the bathtub, in the bathroom, obviously dying. Moments later, paramedics arrived and hustled David into an ambulance. He was still conscious when they took him out on the gurney. One of the deputies asked him why she shot him, and he uttered one word, jealousy. And to my knowledge, that's the last words he spoke. Shot a total of three times, David Daniels died en route to the hospital. No vital organs were hit. Uh, he just bled to death. Untangling the mystery of what happened fell to investigator Cheney Howeth. First on his agenda, speaking to Sharon, who was still at the scene, handcuffed in the back of a squad car. She wouldn't really say anything other than just kept saying David over and over and over again. Hoping she would eventually be able to give a statement, Howith read Sharon her rights and ordered a deputy to drive her to the station. Then he went back into the house to examine the crime scene. There was nothing disturbed. There had not been any type of a struggle anywhere. Everything that had happened, happened on that bed. After photographing the blood-stained bed, the detective drove down to Kilgore's Laird Memorial Hospital and examined David's body. When I, I pulled the sheets back from him and began to look, obviously he was laying in the bed when he was shot, just because of the angles of the bullets. His wound suggested that David had only gotten out of bed after the shooting started when he sprinted to the bathroom. He's trying to get into that bathtub as some shield against these bullets. And the fact that he'd been shot while in bed begged one question. When Sharon first pulled the trigger, was David asleep? It was a question the investigator planned to ask Sharon as soon as he got back to the station. I went into the dispatch and had the 911 tape pulled where she had called, and that was pretty much chilling to me. She gave her address to the dispatcher just as if she was 
having a cordial conversation with someone. You just shot your husband three times. Three times. What is your address, ma'am? 39, 15, 99. Sharon appeared equally calm and collected a few minutes later when Detective Howitt sat down with her in the interrogation room to take her statement. Ms. Daniels went down the line that Mr. Daniels had been not physically abusive to her, but mentally abusive to her. How he talked about her hair looked bad, her shoes looked bad. He wouldn't hold a door for her. He wouldn't carry a chair from the football game for her. But according to Sharon, shortly after she and David awoke that September morning, her husband's mental abuse had suddenly turned violent. She tells him, uh, David, we've got to resolve this. It's Sunday. And she said something about the Bible. He says, you can't tell me nothing about the Bible. She stated at that time that he just turned and, and attacked her. That's when, according to Sharon, she'd gone for the gun. The firearm that was in the house was located in a closet adjacent to the bathroom door. The same bathroom door her husband had bolted towards seconds after the shooting started. She puts herself, when she's telling the story, between him and that bathtub. That just doesn't make sense that he's going to um, go through her to get to that bathtub while she's firing rounds into him. That afternoon, Sharon was booked on murder charges and taken into police custody. Almost immediately, investigators began building a case against her. It wasn't a matter of figuring out who, just basically gathering evidence to disprove her defense. The investigators started with David Daniels' last word, jealousy. But if the Reverend had been having an affair, no one the cops questioned knew anything about it. In my entire investigation, I found no evidence that he had been unfaithful to her. Members of David's church, however, described Sharon as extremely jealous of any attention other women showed her handsome husband. She became physically combative toward other women that would come out and shake his hand and, and tell him that they enjoyed the message he had brought. Miss Daniels, to understate a little bit, wanted to make very clear that that was her husband. And though Sharon had claimed her husband was abusive, the investigation turned up little evidence of it. If anyone in the family was prone to violence, it seemed to be Sharon, not David, which led investigators to only one conclusion. This was most certainly was a crime of sudden passion. She was just unbelievably mad at him. Coming up, According to Sharon, the shooting was the fulfillment of a promise she had made her husband a year before. She had already told him, if you ever lay a hand on me again, I'll kill you. Charged with murdering her husband, Sharon Daniels claimed she'd shot him in self-defense. So when she stood trial on July 11, 2006, the entire case hinged on one question. Was David Daniels a violent man? It's going to be hard to prosecute a woman for uh, killing her husband if, 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 if even one of those jurors believes that she might be a victim of spousal abuse. But was Sharon the victim of spousal abuse? The answer, according to the DA's opening statement, was no. She was not a battered spouse in any, any sense of the way that term's used. To support the claim, prosecutors first called David's ex-wife to testify. She said he never laid a hand on her. Basically, the downfall of the marriage was the bankruptcy, his lack of financial responsibility. She described a person who avoided confrontation, was very uncomfortable with confrontation. When they would have an argument, he would get up and walk in the other room. He just avoided fighting altogether. Next, the prosecutors put the medical examiner on the stand. She testified that contrary to Sharon's statement to the cops, there was no way David had been attacking her when he was shot. The rounds are fired into him while he's laying down for the most part. There was one round we contended that was fired while he's trying to get up. He's trying to get off that bed and he gets the round through the chest. As the medical examiner interpreted the evidence, David had been asleep when the bullets started flying. According to the prosecution's theory, Sharon had lain awake all night, growing angrier and angrier over her husband's fiscal irresponsibility. 
she had worked really hard to maintain her financial stability, and here this guy was who didn't know how to balance his checkbook or whatever. She is just filled with rage and hate at that moment and disgust with him. Shortly before sunrise, according to the DA scenario, Sharon decided to act. She'd taken the gun from the closet, and then, judging from the angle of the bed and the bullet wounds in David's body, crossed to the other side of the room, near the light switch. I contend she turned on the light and she fired three rounds into him before he could ever get out of that bed. The prosecution was arguing that she just snapped and decided she didn't want to be married anymore and so she shot him. As proof, the DA played jurors the tape of the 911 call Sharon made minutes later while her husband was still alive, bleeding to death in the bathroom. I shot him three times. I can't take it anymore. Sharon's attorney, when he started presenting his case, also played the 911 tape for the jury. But according to the defense's version, the it she couldn't take anymore wasn't her husband's irresponsibility. It was his abuse. This is a good woman who had taken beatings from him. And defense attorney Daryl Bennett didn't just ask the jurors to take his word for it. After all, Sharon had called the cops on David once before, a year prior to the shooting. On day two of the trial, the defense put the deputies that responded to that initial call on the stand. Both of them testified that she had marks on her, red marks. And she claimed that he hit her. He claimed that he did not hit her. No one was arrested. Uh, there was no protective order. There was no restraining orders. It wasn't exactly irrefutable evidence of abuse, but it was the perfect setup for what came next. She had to take the stand. You gotta get sympathy from a jury. It was a risky gamble by the defense, but on July 13th, they called Sharon Daniels to the stand to testify in her own defense. She told the jury that when she had called the cops a year before the shooting, it was the first time David, or anyone, had ever hit her. You got a woman here who's, what, 45, 48, and lived all her life with a man and never been hit. And it had to be a shock. Sharon told jurors she'd called the cops, determined to put David in jail. But once her husband was in cuffs and in the back of the cruiser, she hesitated. And she testified she had a good reason. They had the papers drawn up for me to have him arrested and I was getting ready to sign, and I asked the officer, will he lose his job? And they said, yes, ma'am, he probably will. Well, at that point, because of his financial situation and his obligations, I told him I couldn't sign it. Instead, Sharon claimed, once the deputies left, she had given David an ultimatum. She warned him, if you touch me again, I'll kill you. And that, Sharon claimed, was precisely what happened on September 18th, 2005, starting shortly after she and David awoke that morning. I didn't know the severity of how much pain and fear he would cause in trying to kill him. I wanted to stop him. She gets the gun. He's coming at her at the foot of the bed, crossing the bed. She's scared, tells him to stop. He keeps coming at her. Sharon's testimony and demeanor on the stand was compelling. But would it be enough? When the case went to the jury on July 14th, the odds appeared stacked against her. That is, until the hours started ticking by and the jury remained out. There was somebody on that jury who was bound to determine that uh, Sharon was not going to go to prison. They kept telling the judge, we cannot come up with a verdict. He'd say, go back in. After eight hours of deliberation, the jurors finally agreed on a verdict. They found Sharon guilty of first-degree murder. But when they reconvened three days later for the penalty phase of the trial, they could not agree on a sentence. There was about three, maybe four, of the female jurors that didn't want to give her anything. They were hung up on abuse. That meant it would be up to a new jury to determine her sentence. 
in Texas, if they find you guilty and hang up on punishment, you only go back for punishment. And even though Sharon had been found guilty, since she was a first-time offender, there was the possibility that she would be eligible for probation after serving little or no time. A person who'd never been previously convicted of a felony was probation eligible, even for murder. Rather than go through another whole trial, the DA offered Sharon a deal. Enter a guilty plea and serve 10 years in prison with the possibility of parole in five. She took it. On March 1st, 2007, Sharon Daniels entered Hilltop Prison in Gatesville, Texas to serve her 10-year sentence. Her testimony is what got her such a light sentence. It truly is, nothing else. Her testimony and who she was and how she come across.